Hello, everyone. Just waiting for Stefan to pop in. <laughs> hey, <laughs> yeah, man. That, that was a misclick. <laughs> <laughs> That's when two people click the same button at the same exactly. time. Exactly. Is he going to just do it or is he not going? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Hello, Stefan. Lovely to see you again. Hey, nice to see you too. Uh, cool, cool. It's great that this is finally happening. So this was a very exciting week up front. Um, yeah. Great that we are here. Yeah. Um, without further ado, I'll start with, with a quick intro. Mm -hmm. And I would like to say hi to everyone and welcome to our online workshop on Rust for JavaScript developers. And it's so great to have all of you here. Um, we knew that Rust is quite a loved language at least according to the Stack Overflow survey, um, we're gathering such a huge amount of signups over such a short period of time, it just feels unreal. So if you're a fan of high performance, um, reliable and scalable applications, then you'll love Rust because it offers a unique combination of safety, speed and concurrency. And as a JavaScript developer, you already have the skills and knowledge to quickly pick up Rust and start using it in your projects. And that's also part of what Stefan will be covering in a minute. Um, and that's not all. We'll also show you how to use Shuttle, the Rust native cloud development platform. And with Shuttle, you'll see how easy it is to deploy and manage your infrastructure, just like you would with Vercel, um, but, but for backends. Um, it's fast, reliable, easy to use, um, so we can focus on what matters the most, and that's writing great code. All of that said, we are holding this workshop because we believe that Rust has a lot to offer um, for JavaScript developers. It's a powerful language that will help you build better and faster applications. And we want to give you the opportunity to learn more about it and see for yourself what it can do. So without further ado, I'll give the word to Stefan. Stefan, take it away. And thank let's you do very this. Much. Thank you, Ivan. Cool. No um, yeah, yeah, fantastic. So it's so great to be here. And thank you, and uh, thank you everybody for, um, for, so first for the invitation. And to all of you in the stream for showing up, this is very exciting. So we couldn't believe our eyes when we saw uh, the number of, of signups uh, counting up. So, so hey, how are you doing? Um, first, first thing that I need to mention. So um, the folks from Shuttle are, um, are making this workshop real. So they contact me uh, that we could do something together uh, for JavaScript developers. So um, be, be nice to your host. Go to the GitHub page and give give their repo a start. This helps them a lot, and I guess it's it's a fair price for now having three hours of, of Rust for JavaScript developers. So, uh, and with that being said, um, I thought I start um, with a little personal story. So, how how did I end up here? Not not only here on Twitch. So, um, um, I'm 40 years old. I don't know what what Twitch is, so I can't tell you how I end up on Twitch. Something internet magic is going to happen. Fantastic. Um, but more like, how did I end up um, in writing Rust? Um, so I've been doing um, software development, web development for, let's say, more than two decades, 25 years, around about 15 years of that professionally, which means professionally somebody is actually willing to pay me for doing web development. Um, I started out doing, doing C and C++, and then JavaScript mostly was my language of choice. A couple of years ago, I got curious because Rust was, you know, popping up at some places, especially if you look at things like AWS Firecracker um, or, or Firefox, um, who also used Rust um, in the browser. And I got curious and the, the promise was like being an alternative, a memory safe alternative to C and C++, which is quite interesting because, you know, I was coding C and C++, but back in the day, um, my software didn't run for a full day. Because at the, so it, it was running in industry um, um, settings, and at the end of a, of a day, at the end of a shift, um, one person at our clients was turning off the computer, and they always say they were my garbage collector because they made sure that, that the next day I could start with fresh memory and could start working again. So the, and, and we can't afford this anymore. So our software needs to run reliable, needs to run for a very long time, isn't allowed to um, to have pauses um, and Having this promise of um, of memory safety at C and C plus plus like speed, that was very interesting to me. So I dug in. I loved it. I created a project at work. So I work at Dynatrace um, in in Linz, Austria, um, and um, it's now one of the languages that we support. It's one of the languages we write our software in, 
And now I'm can, coming to U-turn. So I started out with doing some systems programming there. And now I see that Rust is also really, really good for all other use cases. So even if it's not designed for web development, it fits there really, really well. And if you have very uh, demanding web tasks, Rust can be a really, really good alternative for that. And my goal today is not to, to sell you Rust in a way like, um, look how easy it is and look how, how fast you are in creating something, but more like, hey, you are writing on a level that you just can write with C and C++, but you can produce results as fast as with any other programming language, but much, much more reliable. So we're going to look at a couple of scenarios where you think, oh, wow, yeah, that, that would have gotten me if I would have done it in any other programming language. Or if I, you know, you would have overseen something in, let's say, JavaScript or Java or whatever programming language that you use. It's basically basically the same story for everything. And this is our goal today. And it's, it's quite a gap, you know. It's like, um, on one end, we are deep down on operating system level uh, 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 granularity, where you say, okay, the, the next thing that I have is basically a, a TCP socket. Cool. Um, and on the other hand, you work on abstractions that feel like a high-level language, but there's a lot of stuff going on underneath. And we are going to span this gap. And this is going to be really, really interesting. So, and this is um, our plan for today. So I start uh, with showing you a li little app, little app that I've written Node.js. It's just a couple of lines of code. And I was, I was astonished how quick I was with that. And then we are trying to create the same app in Rust and talk about all the differences and all the things that we need to think about when writing software at a close, uh, um, um, at, at, at the lower level, but with those nice abstractions up front. So, and with that being said, um, let's start. For folks uh, who want to follow around um, with um, the Rust uh, exercise, I'm going to put um, the final example that we're coding today in the chat. So you can follow along, you can maybe copy a couple of things. Uh, and <laughs> oh, I love the chat, so I'm, I'm going to monitor the chat and uh, Bucham Fushushi judges from my shirt that I should try Hazy Chain. Kid, I live on Hazy Chain. <laughs> but fantastic choice. Fantastic. <laughs> mm. All righty. So um, let's go into familiar territory. This here is um, the Node.js um, application. So it looks like that. So, oh, it's already running. That's nice. So I'm starting it again and then opening up a browser window. You should see my browser. Um, I'm opening up localhost. So this is my chat window. It's not Discord. So then we looked at it and said, yeah, it's nice, but it's not Discord. And this then was the title of, of our application. So I enter my name and then I'm able to, hello, um, chat with people. The problem is it's, it's running on localhost. So the only person I can reasonably chat with um, is myself. Um, so here I am again, and if I say hello here, you can see that um, it's popping up on the other hand, uh, classically WebSocket server. So it's it's basically the hello world of WebSockets, connect something and broadcast messages around and everybody is supposed to listen to it. Um, let's look at how I've implemented it. Again, first the JavaScript version, so we understand what is our approach for that. There might be different approaches, that's fine. It's just one approach and we try to figure out how we can take this and move it to Rust to see What's happening there? Let's get rid of that again. Uh, let's get rid of that again. So uh, I'm using the Express framework. Why? Because oh, it's it's just sweet. You know, it's um, one thing that you can say about Node.js over the last decade or so. You created an ecosystem that you can rely on the shoulder of giants. So this is this is why why Node is um, interesting to us. So I'm I'm using the Express framework. I need a couple of packages that are. Um, within Node, like URL and HTTP, and they also need um, a WebSocket extension. Again, another package that I have not developed. And usually when you work with WebSockets, you are creating a GET connection to a particular URL, and then you're sending upgrade headers. So um, the client asks the server, hey, is this URL here? And if this URL is here, then it's sending an upgrade uh, um, header, where I say, hey, since, since this URL is already here, can we do WebSockets? And then the server has to answer with yes or no. And then if it answers with yes, the TCP connection stays open and packages are exchanged. So this is basically how it works. Um, I'm creating a new Express app. I'm serving static files, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Then I'm creating a new WebSocket server. 
um, I'm uh, creating, so I'm, I'm, I'm taking my app, creating a server out of it. And the moment I get those upgrade headers, um, I see, is this the right path slash WS? Um, is it the right method? And if so, let's handle the upgrade, say that the upgrade has happened, and then we are hopping into a connection. So this is, this is the, the stuff where we just need to upgrade our server to a WebSocket connection or the connection to a WebSocket connection. Um, and um, then we are working with each user. So this is happening for each user. Um, question in the chat, are we supposed to clone that repo and run it locally? You can. So if you like, you can run it with us. The thing is, you know, we, we now have around about, um, I don't know, 250 people here. We had close to 1,000 signups. We thought that it's really, really tough for everybody to code along. So you have two possibilities. Either enjoy the show, <laughs> hopefully, or try to code along as I'm coding along. And if, you, if you're running late or if something doesn't work, don't worry, there's a full version that you can check out later on and that you can try. So this is, this is the idea. Um, okay, the, the moment, I guess I'm making it a little bit bigger. The moment we are getting our connection, um, I'm incrementing a global user ID. So this is just for me to keep track how many users are there so that if you have Stefan one and Stefan two, that you can differentiate between them. You store the web socket in an object based on the user ID. You know, this is what you do in JavaScript. It's, it's kind of ugly. You can guess use a map there or something, um, but, but it's okay. So basically objects in JavaScript are in webs anyways. <laughs> and um, I'm storing the, the entire WebSocket there. So this is an object where I store every WebSocket that has been created. And then I look at the following events. Either I have a message. If I have a message, I parse it. The only thing that I get from a message is name and, and the message itself. So the name of the user and the message that, it's, that the user is being sending. Then I enhance it with the user ID. So I get this little annotation like this is Stefan zero, this is Stefan one, this is Stefan two, or whatever person is joining. Um, and then I'm going over all sockets that I have. So over all sockets from this map users, and I'm sending out the new stringified message. So this is how the server works. I just, you know, receiving it and then sending it out to all the others. Um, the moment one web socket closes, which means the user um, closes the browser, I'm deleting this web socket from the map. So there's no problem by sending it out again, you know, that, that we don't send to a web socket that doesn't exist, that we don't run into any errors or troubles there. So this, this is basically, basically the code that we are dealing with. Pretty straightforward. A couple of things that are questionable. Maybe there are other things on how you can solve this, but this is this is what we are aiming for. And now we want to create the same thing in Rust. Um, there are a couple of things that you need to take care about, or a couple of things that you need to understand. So I'm hopping on to the command line. Um, you are going to install Rust with a tool called RustUp, and um, RustUp is if you come from Node.js and, and no Node.js, it's basically like NVM. So you can manage different versions of Rust. Um, you can um, um, upgrade to the latest stable version. Um, there's every six weeks, there's a new version being released. Um, you can manage like, I'm now on nightly, I'm now on stable. I now want to have a WebAssembly support or I want to compile for Linux, even though I'm on a Mac, or I want to compile for Windows, even though I'm on a Mac. So this is possible with RustUp. You can set your tool chains um, and with those tool chains, you can start developing. One tool that is really, really important with Rust that comes with RustUp is Cargo. Um, and Cargo um, is a little bit like NPM, a little bit like NPM um, as it creates new projects for you. So you can roll out new projects. Um, it manages dependencies for you. You get a, a TOML file where you can, you know, just like in a package JSON, throw in all the dependencies that you are going to use. We are going to use a lot of them. Um, uh, it also allows you to compile it. So not only does it roll out the project, but, you know, you're working on a programming language that creates binaries, which means you need to compile it to a binary. How? There's a tool called Rust-C, that's the Rust compiler. But I don't know all, all the options on how to instruct Rust-C. Cargo does. So Cargo is giving you the possibility to roll out a project, to manage this project, to have the right files everywhere, to loop in dependencies. And Cargo takes care of compiling it as well. There are two modes for that. One is so Cargo build, um, either with dash dash release. This creates a re release version um, of your application. 
which means then the, the compilation times take longer. The compilation is optimized, uh, but you know you pay a little bit of cost for taking really, really long to compile. And with really, really long, it totally depends on what you're compiling. And the other one is without dash dash release, which is the debug version. And debug versions are usually faster compiled, um, but they also get some debug information in it, which means that you can set the breakpoint, hop in, um, and start start debugging. Um, so yeah, that's, that's Cargo. Something that's also cool with Cargo is that it comes with, um, with the possibility to add extensions, uh, like Shuttle. So you can say Cargo install Cargo Shuttle, and then you get the entire Shuttle toolchain in your Cargo as well, which is great because it allows me to you know, scaffold Shuttle stuff, which we're going to do right now. So I'm changing folders here, and I'm saying Cargo Shuttle new, not Discord. This is going to be my app. There we go. And of course, I needed to say Cargo Shuttle init, was it? Cargo Shuttle init, sorry. Dash dash exam. Yeah, cool, cool. <laughs> that works. Uh, and I call the project not, not Discord. I want to have it in a folder called not Discord. Uh, and no, I'm not doing that right now. That's okay. Now I, I'm having this folder not Discord here. There you go. And if we look at the files, it's already giving me some stuff like a Git directory, Git ignore, cargo terminal source file, every, everything. I'm now going into this repository. There we go. Okay. So I'm getting a cargo toml file. And you know it's it's toml, it's not JSON, whatever rules you boat. Um, but you know it 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 is clear what it's going on there. So we have uh, meta information on the package itself. One thing that is very interesting is that Rust works on so-called versions, which means that about every three years the Rust community decides on um, what language features should be our baseline for now. And, and how, how does the Rust community see um, uh, how does the Rust community see the language for the next couple of years? Which means, yeah, of course, you can still add new features, but this marks milestones baselines. You want to migrate from one language edition to the other. Um, here I'm having my dependencies. I'm directly adding a ton more. Um, there we go, uh, because I need I need a couple of those. But um, with Shuttle, I already get you know some connections to Shuttle, um, and of course Exum, which is a framework that we are going to use. So Exum is is kind of an equivalent to Express. It's it's fairly new, but it's beautiful. Seriously, it's beautiful to work with. I'm having so much fun using it, and it's done by, by people who also work at Tokyo. Tokyo is, uh, I'm going to talk about Tokyo a lot um, in just a second. So I'm having my dependencies ready. Um, and yeah, that's that's the cargo tumble. I'm also annotating this to be a library, which means that Shuttle is actually taking over the main part and is introducing my application as some sort of plugin. You can think of, uh, of it like that. Um, one thing that you, that you um, might already notice is that within uh, with Rust, you need some sort of main entry point. So you can't just say, well, um, this is my file and be done with it. Um, you need to have either a function main if you're creating a binary or some entry point that tells you where your software starts. Um, with um, Shuttle, so if I go into the source folder, it is the Shuttle service main file. So it is whatever function it is, and I annotate it with a macro. So this is called a macro that this will be my main entry point. And from there on, my software starts. You know, in, in JavaScript, it's just the index file or the file that you that you um, that you point node to us. But but that's about it. So yeah, and this is just boilerplate. Uh, I'm going to ignore that. That's not that important. Uh, this is going to be the fun part. And uh, because it's so much fun, we are going to create um, a function uh, router and. There we go, and extract that just um, just to turn router. That's router equals router. Just to that to keep the um, the boilerplate code from from shuttle separate from on the actual app. So one one question that I get asked a lot is, um, am I committing too much to a framework here? Um, no, that's not that's not the case. So the thing is, shuttle works with all web frameworks really really well. And to provide a small layer, so it's uh, so you can um, 
add your existing application, which is based on Exum or any other framework, uh, to the shuttle infrastructure. So this is the goal from, from shuttle. And this is happening here in this little function. Alrighty. So, and you know, if you look at it roughly, you can already figure out a couple of things. But before we do that, one more thing, um, get some extensions. So one thing that um, I really can recommend, it's, it's the best Rust extension that there is, is Rust Analyzer. Um, this is the official language server for Rust. So um, I told you that Rust needs to compile stuff and compile times can take long. And this is basically um, um, a quick analysis of your code that gives you compiler errors, um, but without doing a whole compile step within your editor. It also um, takes care of autocomplete. It takes care of getting documentation in. Um, it takes care of giving warnings. So it's, it's a beautiful extension. It's what you actually expect from a tool like TypeScript. Um, but for us, um, and the cool thing is, so I'm using Visual Studio Code here, but you can use it with any other tool as well. So if you are on Sublime Text, um, if you are on Vim or something, Rust Analyzer also works for those uh, editors. Not if you work with the IntelliJ stuff. The IntelliJ stuff um, um, has its own plugin um, um, for Rust, which is also what I've heard quite, quite nice. So people are uh, like using that as well. One thing that you can also install is LLDB. So that's uh, code LLDB, which is a debugger for everything that is being compiled to LLVM. So you take uh, your Rust code, you have a compiler and you compile it to some intermediate language for LLVM. And then LLVM takes your bytecode and compiles it to native code. Um, and, and this one layer, this LLDB layer is um, the same for, for C++, if you, if you use um, um, the, the Mac native uh, um, C++ compiler or for Rust or for Go, there are lots of programming, programming languages targeting LLVM, so you can use the same debugger for that. And those are the recommended, um, the recommended plugins that I would suggest you install if you're doing Rust. And one more thing. Um, so um, what's also pretty cool, I'm opening my workspace setting and I'm saying uh, format on save to true. Um, Rust and Cargo also come along with, um, with their own format. So uh, you might have, you might know Prettier or Standard JS um, and, and they're cool. Um, and Rust has this built in called Rust Font, Rust Format. And if I say format on safe, you know, it, it does all the nice things for me. So I, I just need to adhere to one standard. That's good. I don't need to do anything else. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been in so many discussions on, hey, do you prefer tabs or spaces? And what, what should we use for our software? I, I don't care. Whatever comes automatically. And the cool thing is everybody in the Rust community uses Rust from, So all of the Rust code looks the same, which is really, really nice. So one thing that you also see here at the moment I have Rust Analyze installed, I'm getting those little type annotations here. So those inlays. Uh, don't get distracted by them. So this is not my code. This is just information by the tool that tells me, you know, I know what it is and I can tell you the type right there. So this is the idea of it. Alrighty, lots of setup, but now I guess we are supposed to get started. You've seen already a couple of things. And I, I guess if you see syntax like that, and if you've written a single line of TypeScript in your life, you should understand what's happening here. This is a function, it's fn, it's very short. You don't need to write function. Um, um, I name it router because I'm creating a router and it returns a router. So it returns the type router. Um, you need to have type annotations there. So um, they are not optional like in TypeScript. But TypeScript tries to figure out everything that you do. Um, you need to annotate your types when necessary, but there's still some inference. So if you're creating a new router here, that's great. Um, then uh, TypeScript can tell me, well, if I'm creating a router here, then this needs to be a router. Rust doesn't need to have this information as well. Um, you also see this let thing here. That's also great. You know, we have let in JavaScript as well. That's also very similar. Um, but there is a little bit of nuance to it. So the one thing is that the moment I say let router, this binding, as we call it, we don't call it variable in, in Rust, we call it binding, um, is immutable. So it's immutable by default. You can't change it. You create it once and then that's it. If you want to have something mutable, you need to tell Rust that. Let's say this is a mutable router. 
now I'm going to change something from the router. Oh, this is very interesting. This has some implications on how that stuff is being compiled. The cool thing is once I save that and I have a mutable router that doesn't need to be mutable, uh, tooling and the Rust compiler tell me, well, um, variable does not need to be mutable. So please remove that. So it, it gives me some information on, on, hey, this is something that might not be intentional already because you know it's going to analyze my code all the time. It's creating a binary out of it. So I can remove that. Um, then I'm creating a new router. So this is a struct that I import and this colon colon new means that I'm creating a new instance. So this is like, if you come from, from things like Java or C Sharp, this is like a static method. Um, Kinda, you know, the, the, it's, it's an analogy, but what in reality it does, it's, it's saying, well, um, this is an associate me method with router that doesn't take an instance of router. Um, so cre I'm creating a new router and then I have a fluent interface where I can define a new route. So this is now with an instance. So colon colon means for the struct dot for the instance, defining a new route at the path slash hello. Then I'm having a get method that executes the hello world function up there. So this is basically what's happening there. Um, that's, you know, that's just enough source code that you can read it. It shouldn't be too distracting if you have ever programmed anything in your life. Um, one thing that is interesting though, so I'm creating here a route named them and I'm returning the router. Fair enough, that's good. Um, the cool thing is um, I can write it differently and it opens up a whole new set of possibilities. Um, before I'm showing you what is possible, please tell me in the chat, JavaScript devs, are you team semicolon or team no semicolon? I'm really, really curious about that. There's a little delay, so I'm waiting for, okay. Semi, 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 semicolon. Okay, semi, no semi, always. No, oh boy, oh boy, I can't, I can't read all of them. <laughs> uh, okay, so Kaisu even sets in 10 semicolons, just to be sure. So this is, <laughs> If you really want to make sure that your statement is going to end, uh, uh, just add a couple of semicolons, <laughs> just to be sure. Fantastic. A couple of you are no semi. So the thing is, um, um, uh, in Rust, it actually matters if you are adding a semicolon or if you don't. So the moment you add a semicolon, what I've written here becomes a statement. Um, and then I'm returning that, you know, but I can, so this is also, also a statement here, but I can't just say, well, if I'm dropping the semicolon, everything that is written here becomes an expression. And then I can return it just like that. So I don't need to write return. Return is actually used for um, um, early exits. So if you are in a control phone and say, oh no, I want to stop here. Let's return with an error, for example. Um, you, um, you can use return for that. Um, in all other cases, you usually say, well, I'm, I'm just using the expression and it takes on the value. This is like, um, for example, I have a, a binding called X and it is five, that is cool. But I just create this binding and say, if uh, true, notice, no parentheses, that's nice. I set X to five. Um, otherwise, I'm setting um, X to six. Um, that's, that's possible, fantastic. But you can do it differently as well. You can say, well, you want to initialize X, let's drop the statement and create an expression out of that. So it's if true, and then don't assign it, but return the value as drop the semicolon and let's evaluate, let's evaluate the expression. And the same here. And then you need to put the semicolon there. Of course, I'm missing the assignment here. So you can do it just like that. And it says, well, there's no semicolon, so it's an expression, so it's being returned. You know, this is, this is how expressions work in Rust. And there's, there's now, you know, um, meaning behind a semicolon. A semicolon means I'm stopping my statement here. Next statement. Um, no semicolon means it's an expression. So the moment I say router semicolon, it says, hey, oh, whoa, whoa, you're not returning a router. You need to return a router. You just found nothing. You found the empty type. Removing it, and you're there again. This also means that with with Everything being ex an expression, unless you put the semicolon afterwards, means that you, for example, don't have things like ternary expressions. Why would you? You can use if, whoops, you can use if everywhere. Why would you need to have um, um, an, an, an explicit expression for ternary operations if you just can use an if? 
And you know, you can then again say something like here, okay, this is if true, but what if, if false, then four um, else five, you know, you can you can nest those and, and I just leave out the semicolons and it's just going to be evaluated. And this is a really nice way of programming in, in my opinion. This is also something where I say, uh, if I ever go back from Rust to TypeScript, this bites me. This bites me so much because I just say, yeah, well, router, what else needs to be said? JavaScript. It says everything. Uh, but JavaScript has a different opinion on that. So, hmm. um, um, so this is one of the things that are odd at first, but you, you really, really um, get to love it. So you really, really enjoy um, using features like that. And this makes Rust a really, really elegant language. We're going to see a couple of those things. Um, again, we, we are working on C++ level um, um, speed and, and creating native binaries, but we have an elegant language, a language that really helps us writing expressive code. And this is just, I'm, I'm gushing all over again. I'm so sorry. So I, I, I was teaching a university yesterday on the topic and I'm constantly gushing over such a beautiful language and it's totally genuine uh, because I really, really like working with well, yeah, let's drop that. So we are creating a router here. Let's, let's create a real router for a change. So uh, we have this hello route. This is great. Um, if I'm going to say cargo shuttle run, so I'm running my shuttle software here. It's compiling stuff that takes a little while. I'm having this hello route here that maps to this asynchronous function. Um, then I'm able to try it out in a second. The question is, don't you think that new people that go in Rust ecosystem ha will have to understand that instead of just using return explicitly? Um, so Super Jackie asks, I'm putting, I'm putting this question online. Um, this is a really good question. Yeah, so this is something that you are going to learn. Um, I'm putting those things up front in this, in this course. We're going to create a real app, of course. But you know, those are those nuances where you say, oh, this is really, really different. Um, and you need to get used to it. Uh, don't get me wrong. So at the beginning, I was writing return all the time because I was used to it, not only from JavaScript, but basically from any other language that uses C-like syntax. So that's that, that's kind of common, common thing. The moment that you understand that you can use um, expressions, your code is going to change drastically. Um, and your code becomes a, a lot, lot nicer. And actually, I guess in everything that I'm writing now, you don't see any return statement at all anymore. Um, so we are going to see a few examples where this, this will happen, or where we are going to see um, situations where expressions become really, really handy. So yeah. Uh, Kaisu um, also says something very interesting. Uh, you can do a loop in there. Yeah, you can do a loop in there and then break with the value at some point in time. It's fantastic. So that works That works just as well. Okay, cool. Um, I built this app. Let's see what's happening with the Hello World. I'm curling localhost 8000 slash hello. And hey, Hello World. Cool. That works. We're having a server there. Now let's create something really, really cool. Um, one thing that I want to do first is I want to serve my static files. So I'm going to copy everything from um, the node example. Um, static uh, over here. I cool, the static folder is there. Let's make a real quick look if it is really the same static folder. That's fantastic. And now I'm going to use some framework code again. So um, the moment my app is deployed on Shuttle, I can't access the file system like that anymore. That's a security um, uh, measurement. But I, I know my working directory. I can get access to my working directory. So I'm using um, in my boilerplate code from Shuttle. Let me quickly uh, copy that. I am going to use um, um, a static folder like here. So I'm using this macro static folder, static folder. This is going to be injected by Shuttle like, hey, your files are here, use this file and it's going to be a path path. I'm just importing that um, uh, into my into my um, list of imports up here. Uh, and I'm getting, getting a path path type, which is a representation of an actual path um, on, on the disk. Um, and I'm going to pass it here as an argument. So I'm also having the static folder here. It's also of type path off, and I'm passing it along static down here. Cool. Now I'm having the static folder here, and now I'm creating a service that can serve files. So um, the thing is, um, especially with Rust in the ecosystem, 
you need to um, work with a lot of packages to get things done. And what I'm going to do here is like not surf this static folder, but I'm defining my routes here. And in case anything goes wrong, please use the files from that. So I'm creating a new directory, which directory, which is surf here, which is um, a service from, from some, some library that I prepared. Um, and I served in new with the static folder. There you go. So this uh, already is able to serve the static folder and now I need to make it compatible with Exum. So I'm creating um, another directory where I say this is a get service. So every get request um, should lead to this service. There you go. Um, Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, I don't have any type annotations yet because I need to um, first get um, um, a fallback for the fallback, which is an async function handle error, which returns. I'm going to talk about that in a second. An into response uh, where I'm returning a status code um, not found um, and a set emoji. That should do it. And import into response. So this is the this is the fallback handle. So the idea is that oh, those are my paths that I'm going to define. If that doesn't work, go to this directory and look if there are any files. If this doesn't work, send a 404 with this handle error. So I'm saying, well, handle error, handle error. And this is framework code. You don't need to, to memorize all of that. That's totally fine. And I guess, sorry, I need to tell it there is an actual error which is standard IO error. So a couple of things that are here. So this works and now I need to just hook it up, um, which means I say fallback service directory. A couple of things here that are to be noticed. So first of all, um, um, one thing that is cool about Exum as a framework is that I define a function like that that takes any parameter and returns an input into response. So this is this is a type just like an interface where I say, say whatever comes back, you need to be compatible to into response. This is this is all I'm asking. What other what else it doesn't interest me? And this thing here, like having um, a type that has not found and the string, is compatible with into response. This is already great. And I can use this as a callback function for the last thing in my layer cake, like first my routes, then the directory, and then I'm having an error. Um, first my routes, then my directory, and then I'm having an error. So that's that. One thing that you also see is I'm moving an underscore here up front. If I remove that underscore, I'm getting a warning. Hey, you have an unused variable. With the underscore, I can say, well, I'm not using it. Compiler be okay with it. So if you if you've done Go, for example, Go won't let you compile if you have an unused variable. Even if you just you know temporarily have an unused variable because you want to try something, that doesn't work in Go. In Rust, you can just put an underscore in, in here, and you don't have any warnings. That's great. Also, something that is really interesting about Rust as a language is this here. I can just redeclare bindings. That's called shadowing. You say, well, this is my new directory. Whatever comes before, I don't care anymore. It doesn't matter anymore. The old directory is gone. I'm new, I'm the new directory, um, and you know there are a couple of couple of things in computer science that are hard. One of them is naming things. Um, yeah, no, not a problem anymore. Just reuse the same name if you don't care about the old name again. So this is also one of those nuances in Rust that are just so 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 nice. Uh, you're absolutely right. That uh, and caching is the other thing. So there are two things in computer science that are hard, naming things, caching, and one by off errors. I guess, I guess we are through with them. Um, please tell me more. <laughs> so all, also one of those nuances, which are so, so nice, especially think about you know, trying a couple of things out and um, copying just the same block over and over and over again, and it will just work. Um, so this is, this is really, really great. Um, DedX, yeah, RegEx is also a hard problem in computer science, or tech debt. One of those two things. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Um, Ormus asks, could the handle error uh, be chained off the route instead of the get service function? Let's try it out. Um, I think that could be possible. Um, there we go. Nope, um, doesn't work with those types. So I guess this is what Exxon 
what exome needs uh, to have. Um, that might be an, an exome, um, exome thing. But I could, for example, not put it in here, uh, but put it in here. Then it would work. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, that's already great. So we used a couple of dependencies. This is, you know, um, they are very well documented. You need to figure it out. Um, I, I know this is this is maybe a lot if you're just starting out, but especially with Axum, the documentation is really, really good. So I also just cobbled together everything that I could find and put it on there. Let's see if that actually works. Um, cargo, shuttle run. There we go. Not this code is running. And now I'm opening up my browser again, and now um, let's remove the old ones and let's go to localhost colon 8000, I guess it is. There you go. Oh, fantastic. That's my shuttle server. Great. Hello. But I can't check yet. So this doesn't work. But hey, I'm serving, I'm serving static files with a couple of lines of code. Great. Again, C++ like speed, a programming language that compiles to something that is compatible with C++, or that is, is on a level with C++. And this is also something that I, that I want to, to highlight here. Um, writing stuff like that, an async function that returns a type, or defining my routes like that, you know, that's pretty nice, actually. Um, that's actually very, very high level. But still, I'm working with something that is kind of in the same area as C++. Person asks, impl is like an interface in other languages, kind of. So, um, uh, if we if we say something like that, impl into response, we call that a trait. So this is called trait, um, which defines abstract behavior like an interface in other languages. But um, there's a reason why it's called traits uh, and not interfaces, because an interface is only allows you to say this is my interface and you need to be compatible with it. But traits can do much much more. So with traits, you can say um, um, you can define traits, and you can say that your types like your structs are implementing this particular trait. Your types can also implement foreign traits, like traits defined by other people. And you can also implement your traits that you own, that you defined for foreign types, which means that you can make all other types that exist compatible with your software. Um, does that mean it only requires a subset of the type interface? Uh, you mean this one particular line here? No, it, it just says everything that, that is here needs to be compatible with it. So I can, um, I can for example, say, um, um, boom, boom, boom. So I, I don't need to actually I just say into, and then it, it will be uh, uh, converted into an into response. Um, but I also, also one thing that works like in, in into response is, for example, um, that's the string that also works. And I can say now, well, you might be actually HTML. Then I'm getting an HTML header and stuff like that. So all of those structs, and also this is a type, you know, um, this is a type that has two elements. One element is um, the status code and the other element is the string, you know. They're also um, um, supposed to be, um, um, and, and they're also supposed to be compatible with into response. You said struct was like a static method. No, 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 no. Um, 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 this is a struct, which is like a class. It's a, it's a, a compound type of various primitive types. Um, and this is a static method or a static function of this class. So you can do something like, let's do a quick detail. You can do something like struct person. Um, you have uh, a name of type string and an age of type, let's say u, u32, um, u32. Um, string is clear. Uh, U32 means uh, answered integer of 32 bits. So everything that works into, into 32 bits. And this is this is my, my struct here. Um, and then you can say you want to implement structs. So you're creating, an, um, you want to implement that struct. You create the person here. And then you can say, well, I have a function new that returns a person. And it takes a name of string and an age of U32. Uh, and then you have well, well return self with name and age. That should do it. Um, and then you have this static method on this class, if you will. So this is this is um, 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 an analogy that works there. Um, the implant response is simply saying that it will return something that has the same method set into response implements 
exactly that ex that is that is absolutely true. Um, while we are at it, um, Dedex is asking really really good questions that we are going to see later on as well. But I just I just continue there. Um, you can also say like something like get uh, name, um, and then you say self. Um, and this is a lowercase self. So this is an uppercase self, and this is a lowercase self. And here I can say, well, then please return self dot name. Okay, this this works. Um, again, just an expression, no semicolon. Um, here it's a placeholder for the struct itself. So it says it's an instance of of the struct. And here it's so it's it's creating an instance of the struct. And here I'm working with an instance of the struct. And what's happening here is that I can say stuff like um, person colon colon new. Uh, with um, Stefan dot into string, uh, sorry, to string, um, and 40. So this is my person. And this is a static method, but the moment I'm having self here, I can just use dot. I can use dot get name. I can also say um, colon colon, uh, let's do it like that, let person. Let's move that down so I don't get compile errors. I'm creating this person here. And then I can also say, person, colon, colon, get name, and they need to have the first parameter to be this little person, okay? So this is this is how, how this works. The moment I have, I have self, um, I can use it, I can use it as an associated method, like that, person.get name. I can use it like that. Um, and in reality, it's mapped to something like that. So this is, this is the, this is the idea of that, okay? Um, yeah, Alpha Cake says it really, really well. Um, self is a type and lowercase self is an instance. That's true. That's true. Uh, cool. Self name H was does name H default to when you call new. Um, so two my parameters here that I pass along. So if the message signature has self as the first parameter, it's no longer a static method. Yeah, exactly. That's that's how you can see it. It's like an associated method. Really good on, really good questions here. I'm very happy that you engaged so much. This is fantastic. Thank you very much. Alrighty, but I hope you don't mind. I'm going to kill everything with that because I want to continue with the rest. Because now we are going to get into. Um, so I'm, I'm always, you know, gushing about um, gushing about um, um, the syntax and how nice it is. Um, and uh, I also um, want to go to the other thing that is really important in Rust, which is the whole memory management thing. And everything that we are doing then with the WebSockets here needs to be taken with care because there we are going to go into um, memory management issues that wouldn't be a problem in other languages, but which, are, which require some thought of you. And Rust is a programming language that is, yeah, well, you, you, can, you can just hack with it and produce a couple of rough prototypes. If you, you know, if you're already familiar with the language, you can totally do that. But actually, every step of, of that you take requires at least some thought if, you know, things can get nasty. Um, and you're going to see a couple of those things. Um, one thing that I haven't shown you in the example earlier on with the JavaScript example, you know, we, we have this global object and we are changing stuff there constantly. With every connection, we are adding a WebSocket there and we're also reading the WebSocket. Uh, so this is this is pretty pretty rough stuff if you think about it from memory management point of view. Um, it works in JavaScript because JavaScript is single-threaded. So you don't have duplicate access on the same memory. Uh, or um, multiplexes on the same memory. We can't afford that in Rust. In Rust, it might be that different actors from different threads point to the same memory and want to change something or want to read something. Or the memory gets reallocated because, you know, I'm, I'm storing something in a vector or in an array and, oh, I don't have enough memory left. Let's put it to some other place. And then all the references would be invalidated. And this is where Rust really, really helps us. So again, this is now where the whole system level programming stuff shines through. And this is going to get really, really interesting. Okay, so I'm getting rid of the hello world because now we want to do some real stuff. And I say, well, I'm making the WebSocket um, connection. So this is route at slash WS, just like in the example early on. And I'm having here this get method where I say the handler is not hello world, but 
handle um, WebSocket upgrade. I'm writing, this does not exist, so I'm writing an async function, <laughs> an async function, handle WebSocket upgrade, it takes a WebSocket upgrade, WebSocket upgrade a parameter and returns an input into response again. There we go. Um, again, the way um, the way um, Exum works is that I can pass in here a function and it sees from this method signature what it needs to inject. Um, why is this so? A couple of questions. Why has this self threading made its way into Rust that has caused so much grief in JavaScript in the past? No, no, no. It, um, wait, I, I'm I'm going I'm going to I'm going to answer this real quick. So so Wade asks why has this self paradigm made its way into Rust? This has caused so much grief in JavaScript in the past. In JavaScript, it was totally different because in JavaScript we are somehow trying to manage pointers uh, because the this scope. Uh, this was, was constantly different because this was always relative to a function scope. Um, and then you introduce the self, self variable to keep track of the actual disk of your instance, which was very, very cumbersome. I mean, you're totally right. That has caused grief in JavaScript in the past. That's totally true. Um, and um, this here is different because here it's just syntax for an entirely different concept. So I guess it was Dedex who said that self is the uppercase self is a type. Yes, it says, well, you need to be, it's, it's a placeholder. I could also write person there. That's okay. It's just a placeholder. If I'm having very complex types that I need to deal with, then I can just use self as a placeholder. And the lowercase self just tells me whatever I'm getting here, it needs to be of the instance that, that my type is. And they are just, they are just pointers. So they are part of the syntax. They are part of the concept of defining structs and not like a paradigm that you use in, in JavaScript to work around its shortcomings. And this is important to know. Um, so it's, it's, it's basically just syntactic sugar for helping you writing the real thing. So yeah, I, I hope this, I hope this, this works because um, maybe, maybe real quick to, to that questions. I'm sorry if I'm derailing here, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to get back again, but if I'm having this struct person, let's just keep an empty struct and I say input person here. Um, I can totally say, well, uh, get name. I don't have a name yet, but um, here I'm going to say string. Um, and I can make an associated function with self. That's okay. So now I'm expecting an instance of person there. I can also say, well, you need to have a person which is of type person. Um, then, I could, then, I could, then I could totally use it in the same way, you know, but uh, not as an associated method. So I, then I, the only thing that I can do is call person colon colon get name. I could never call person dot get name, so this is this is uh, here behind there. So and and now I'm I'm closing it down. Don't worry. Um, okay, I just got a got a, a small heads up. That's great. Um, alrighty, so I want to handle this WebSocket connection again. This is happening through um, through dependency injection. So I'm having this WS. Um, 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 dependency injected here, and I can then say, well, if I if an upgrade works, please handle my WebSocket here. So this is what I'm going to to call here. I'm also creating an async function handle socket, which takes the actual WebSocket. There you go. This is the actual WebSocket that we can work with. Okay, cool. This is everything that we need to create the WebSocket upgrade. This is great. So. Now we want to do something with this WebSocket upgrade. So we want to connect all our users uh, together. And stuff is going to get nasty here. So I'm having this WebSocket here, um, and they can receive stuff. That's cool. So I can say while um, um, while let message is if stuff so all to create, I have a while loop and say well um, I'm I'm assigning a new binding here based on what I'm getting here. This is a future, which means I need to await it. So this is how you um, this is how you await in um, in Rust. You're not having a wait before; you're having it afterwards, which allows you to chain lots of await calls. Which is ah, it's seriously it's so beautiful again. It's a nuance, yes, but it's super, super, super beautiful. Um, and I'm already getting my first error here. So the thing is, receive is actually mutable. So there's a point internally that moves around memory and that needs to be moved. And I uh, and, and Rust is not allowed to change anything. 
uh, because it can't borrow WS as mutable. So I need to declare it as mutable. The first thing that I need to do is say, well, it needs to be mutable. Now I can do that. Great, that's fantastic. So now I can receive messages, ignore option result message error for now. This is not so important. Um, maybe just do a, a print line uh, where we say, well, give me, give me the output of that. Just like that, okay. So now I can receive messages. Cool, that's great. But I also want to send messages. So the moment I receive a message from some, some place, um, I also want to be able to say, well, let's send a message, like message, colon, colon, text, um, hello world, something like that. Okay. Um, yeah. And I need to import it as well. Um, tummy time 21 says it's Rust similar to Haskell. Rust has um, lots of um, inspiration from Haskell. So Haskell uh, and in general, uh, ML languages like OCaml and something like that. Um, rebounded ask, is it improper to implement OOP design patterns in Rust? It doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> um, implementing uh, OOP design patterns in Rust does not work because you don't have inheritance. You have uh, something like interfaces, which are traits, and you can implement interfaces for your types. That's true. But you don't have inheritance, which restricts you in a lot, a lot of ways. Um, also, um, yeah, a couple of nuances there, but I would like to take that, take that off. OK. Now we have now we have um, um, a problem. Uh, so this also needs to be um, to be awaited. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm getting a couple of warnings. Uh, I'm, I'm having here an unused result. Let's ignore that. Now I'm having a problem now. So this is sequential code. You know, um, this is uh, sequential code, and this doesn't work with something where you get. Um, where you get you know, messages on one side and you want to send messages to the other side. So this is, this is what we are trying to do. Um, so you need to somehow separate those two from each other. So one thing that you could do, which, which we are going to do now, is we are in an asynchronous environment. Let's take one of those calls and put it, make it asynchronous. So usually in JavaScript, we would put, put it in a promise and say, you are now working, um, you are now working as a task on the event loop and you're just putting it on the site and wait for, um, um, for um, messages later on. This is actually what also happens in our JavaScript code where we have this callback, you know, um, where we have this callback where you uh, then can execute some code if an event happens. Behalak asks, why um, does the WS parameter need to be mutable? I explained that earlier because this receive call is moving a pointer in memory where it says, well, um, this is the message, but now comes a new one and this might change depending on the size of the message. This is why receive needs to be mutable. We also see that if we hover over that, that it needs to take a mutable self so that the method signature tells us this needs to be a mutable self. Okay. Alrighty. So what I want to do is like, I want to split those two tasks, the send task and the receive task into two separate tasks. I want to split them away so they can, um, they can work independently because this would just be sequential. So I just would stuck in this endless loop because it would always be waiting to receive something and it would never be able to send something. But I actually would love to do that both at the same time, like sending stuff on one side, receiving stuff on the other side. So I do something like um, Tokyo. This is, um, ah, this is also something that I need to explain. Um, you have, as we have seen, you have async primitives in Rust, OK? You have, um, we have uh, the async keyword. You can await things. That's also good. If I'm removing the await thing, um, I'm getting an input future here, which tells me, oh, this is a promise. This is something that you need to await, OK? We know that. Um, so I can await that. You have those primitives. But in Rust, you don't have an asynchronous runtime. So you have language primitives that tell you that this might be run, this might run in an asynchronous context, but Rust doesn't provide you an asynchronous runtime. This has been a deliberate decision, by the way. So Rust has a very good standard library that takes you from, yeah, one level above operating system level. So you get things like memory allocation. Um, TCP connections, standard in, standard out. Um, this is all stuff that you get. What you don't get is things like random numbers, regular expressions, and the synchronous runtime. This is what you don't get. You need to get that from 
um, other resources. And th it has a really good ecosystem. I'm going to share something here in the chat with Kick, which is called blessed.rs slash crates, um, which is a really good resource for the non-standard standard library. And one thing that is, um, that is important here is uh, Tokyo as an asynchronous runtime. Um, and uh, we are using Tokyo because, you know, Exum is using Tokyo, Shuttle is using Tokyo. I guess if you're doing web stuff and networking stuff, then Tokyo is the one thing that you need to go to. So I'm asking Tokyo now, the asynchronous runtime, please spawn a new task, okay? So make this, what I'm giving you here, is synchronous and putting it on the side. And Phosphorus says, um, yeah, the, the Node.js um, uses as an asynchronous runtime LibUV, that's true. And Deno uses Tokyo, actually. So if you're using Deno, this is the event loop of Deno. But hey, we are now at this level where we are actually in instructing an asynchronous runtime on what to do. It's pretty cool. And I'm making, having here an async block. Async block. Where I say, um, please receive messages. Okay, receive messages from this, from this particular uh, WebSocket. And now I'm having a problem. Now it tells me, well, um, you want to do something with WS here, but WS has already been moved to someplace else. And this is where we enter the fantastic area of ownership. Ownership is this, this, this unique concept in Rust that deals with memory management. And it's pretty unique, um, not that unique. So there are other, other things, other programming languages as well that, that work uh, with the concept. But in a way, so the way Rust does it uh, in a general purpose language uh, that um, um, is geared as a C++ alternative, that's pretty unique. Um, ownership tells me that there can only be one owner of a piece of memory. This is important. Listen to this. I have a binding like here in WS and the memory attached to this binding lives as long as WS lives. And the thing is, WS lives for as long as there is a block that can own this binding. So I'm entering this block here, and it ends here. And the moment it ends here, it's being dropped. Memory is being freed. So basically, if I'm creating a function uh, ownership, there you go and I'm having um, this X here, it's being created at this line and it's being dropped at this line. This is how, how ownership works, um, which is great because as a compiler, you can easily say, well, allocating memory, freeing memory, allocating memory, freeing memory, pretty easy. Now we have here this one particular situation where we say, well, this is a task that we are going to put, um, um, to put aside. So this is something that runs in a different scenario. Uh, we are going to move all the ownership into this particular task here, which means WS is now not, not owned by handle socket, which you know starts here and drops here because at the end of this curly brace, everything is dropped. It's now part of this block that runs in a different context where it's being dropped here. So it's being dropped at line 47, um, which might be that you know at line 49, it doesn't exist because it has already been dropped. Okay, and Rust tells me, you know, you, the thing that you're doing here, that memory might be gone. You need to do something about it. You need to do something with this WebSocket struct because it might be that the moment you're using it here, it's already gone. It's already been thrown away. And we have a couple of ways to do that. So there are a couple of ways that we can work with that. One thing are references. So I can say, for example, well, I'm having here um, I'm having here a vector of numbers. Um, see, that's vec. One, two, three, four. There you go. Um, and I could say, well, um, let's do like function take ownership. And I don't know about you, but I am going to, and I, I'm, I'm hating error messages, so I'm just, just ignoring that. So it takes ownership, so it takes um, it takes a VEC, which is a VEC of IL32. There you go. Um, so um, 
Yeah, there you go. I'm saying here, take owner, take ownership of this vector. There you go. So I'm allocating it here. I'm parsing it here as an owned value, which means I can, for example, print it here. There you go. Um, it has ownership of this being used up there. Um, it takes ownership, which means at the end of this, uh, this curly brace, it's going to be dropped memory free, which also means that if I'm calling it again, I'm getting a compiler error because it has already been moved. So VEC is, has already been taken. It has already been dropped. You can't use it again. It's not there anymore. There can be only one owner, OK? So what I could do is, let's say, well, then, then for God's sake, let's return it again. Yeah, that checks out, but that's also pretty ugly, isn't it? So um, that's not something that I would recommend. Um, you can also tell Rust, well, please don't pass it, don't, don't move it to a new owner. Rather, give it a reference so you can read it, but don't, don't change anything. So I can say, well, I'm not expecting a vector here, and I'm also not returning a vector. You can say, I'm expecting a reference to this vector. And then look at that. Rust immediately yells at me, hey, 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 you are sending a vector, but I'm expecting a reference. So please give me a reference. You need to be explicit about that. Now it works again. So now I can pass explicitly a reference to that piece of memory. The owner is still here. The owner is still this one at line at, at line 39. And I'm just passing in references. And the moment I'm, I'm ending here, I just drop the reference. Not exactly, but it's, it's a good way to visualize it. And then you use another reference and again and again and again. And this is how you can read stuff. So this is not taking ownership. Um, this is taking a reference. Um, what you also can do is like um, function modify value, where I say, well, I need to take a mutable reference. So if you pass something here, I want to change it. So you can be the owner, but I want to be the one that is going to change stuff. So I say, well, back to push five, there you go. And then I need to say modify value of a mutable vector. Ah, there we go. So it needs to be a mutable reference. Uh, and of course, I need to declare it mutable here as well. So, and, and now it becomes immediately clear from looking at not only the signature of the method, but also from what I'm passing here, what my ownership relationships are. What am I expecting? I'm expecting here a mutable reference to a vector. I'm expecting here a shared reference to a vector. There's a question. Um, so changing ownership moves the memory location, but the reference holds the memory location. No, the thing is, so this is, this is a very important point. So the thing is here, um, let's assume I'm having this vector of four elements and this is the owner, you know? Um, and this, this reference here just points to that piece of memory, okay? And it can't change anything. It's just a shared reference. You're just reading it. But this mutable reference might change something. And the thing is, this mutable reference can just exist once. So if you're mutating something, there's only the possibility that you change it once and you don't have any shared reference to it because, you know, memory might change. But the mutable reference then tells the owner, hey, memory has changed. This is your new address. So there is, you can have multiple shared references. That's totally okay. So I can have um, let ref one is um, n percent back. Let ref two um, um, is n percent back. So that, that totally works. And if you look at it, uh, they're becoming it, it's becoming part of the type. Um, and then I'm using let um, mute one is n percent mute back. So this still should work. But the moment I'm adding a let mutable uh, two, which is a mutable vec, there you go again. Um, this only works if I'm not using it um, somewhere. So the moment I'm using it, I'm getting errors. Look at that. So I can't 
hey, you're having a mutable reference and you're changing something, you can't have another mutable reference. This doesn't work. Also, you can't create new references because it might change something. So Rust tells you, this is really, really problematic. Don't do that, okay? This is how you, how you, how the borrow checker makes sure that, hey, what you're doing here is really, really, uh, really, really troublesome. It doesn't yell about ref1 and ref2 because, hey, they are, they are not used anywhere. They don't matter, but they matter. So those here, they matter. Taking a reference here, they matter. That's it. This is why they are going to, to scream at you. Okay, so this is this is ownership 101. And we are dealing with ownership here down in handle socket. And um, one thing that we can use here, which is actually quite nice, is, um, well, we are having um, two parts of it. We're having a socket where we get stuff in and get stuff out, okay? And... Um, so there's a question and moving take a reference after modify. I don't exactly know what it means, but don't worry. So um, we are having here this one socket um, that has two connections, one incoming, one outgoing, okay? Um, and we can actually take those two parts separately. So we can say, well, I'm going to have um, a receiver. No, sorry, I'm going to have a sender and a receiver if I'm going to split the web socket into two parts. Now I'm having a sender and a receiver. And look at that, I'm already getting errors because web socket doesn't exist anymore. So I'm getting errors used of move value WS. Look at the method signature of ws.split. It takes an owned type. So it says self without an ampersand, without a mutable ampersand, uh, ampersand mutable. It just says self, split self. So after that, web socket is gone. After that, the original WebSocket doesn't exist anymore, which keeps me from a lot of troubles, from a lot of troubles because I can't do anything with WS anymore because it has been split into sender and receiver. I can work with sender and receiver and um, um, can, um, can work with both individually and can make sure that the original WebSocket is gone. So I'm going to work on those two topics uh, in a second. Um, so um, again, look at that. It says in the method signature, it takes self, and then I'm going to get two parts of the same WebSocket. So uh, Eric Tonica asks, what is split? I'm splitting the WebSocket into a readable part and a writable part. Um, and, um, and the method signature self, without an ampersand, tells me I'm owning it, which means after that it is gone which means I can't use it anymore. So this is what it tells me. Now I have a mutable sender and a mutable receiver. Um, Futureproof D asks, is it like destructuring an object? Not quite. So actually what I'm getting here is um, um, I'm getting a tuple pack of two items and I assigned it to two different parts. So yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of destruct, kind of like destructuring, but you have an actual type for that. So yeah. Okay, so this has been a lot to take right now. Um, I'm pretty pretty much there where I want to be. Um, if it's okay for you, um, and I'm looking in, uh, looking uh, um, at Ivan as well, let's take a quick five minute break. I need to refill my tea. I want to do a lot of stuff with you uh, in the second part. Now that we know how to deal with ownership, let's sync that in. Give me a couple of uh, a couple of questions uh, in the chat, and then we continue in roughly five minutes. Let's say at 620. Is that okay for you, Ivan? Yeah, that's okay for me. And I would like to take this chance to tell everyone that this is pretty much the last chance to fill out the survey that we have sent to you via email um, a couple of times. Um, there's a chance to win a hundred dollar gift card and the well, winner cool. I'm going to do that. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and and the winner will be picked um randomly after our QA session. Um at the end of the workshop in, in, in our workshop Discord channel. So make sure to fill it out. Here's the link. There we go. And now I think we, we all deserve a, a five minute break. Yeah, five minute breaks, roughly 6.20. I'm going to, uh, uh, to refill my teeth, stretch my legs, and then I'm on for even more. So I'm really excited about doing that, folks. Okay, help, help see you in five first. minutes. See you guys. Huh? Yeah.
Okay, hi. Um, welcome back, folks. Um, five minutes are a very short amount of time. <laughs> but hey, here we are back again. So I'm adding my code back to the stream. Um, there have been a couple of questions there. So one thing is, how does ws.split tell me that this is then going to go away? So I'm having this method here. I'm going to go to the definition. I can look at all the source code. This is a lot to take in. Don't worry about it. This is giving you probably a hard time if you just started out. But look at this function here, function split self. This self is not, um, let's say, um, an ampersand self. This would mean a reference. It's not a mutable self. This would mean a mutable reference. It's just self, which means that the moment you pass self along, like the instance of the struct, starting curly brace, ending curly brace, it will be dropped. Uh, um, this will be consumed. Um, I mean, it's then it's then uh, going to go into two other types there. Sure enough, or that actually is actually it's actually consumed here because you're passing it along here as well. Um, but after that, ownership tells me from this method signature that this is going to be consumed, so it won't be there anymore. But I'm having two, two new structs anyway. Um, and um, as an added benefit, I as a developer know that, well, yeah, well, um, um, it's gone. I can't use it anymore, so I can't do anything with WS afterwards. So uh, WS dot um, whatever, close. I'm getting an error. It has been moved already, used of moved value. So I can't use it because here it has been moved in WS. Um, this is different to, um, let's say, I guess if I do uh, sender.send, uh, if you look at that, um, sender.send, I'm an error here, but, uh, ah, okay. I'm in here. Sender.send takes a mutable, let's go to the definition, takes a mutable reference of self, which means, okay, internally it's something going, is going to change. But it's just a reference. You, you can reuse it afterwards. So this is the idea. And you see that from the method signature. This is the nice idea. The moment, the moment you, are, you, are, you are understanding ownership, you see from, from those small things um, how the ownership rules are. And um, this is one thing, I guess, I guess we, should, we should talk about Rust uh, also in that regard. Um, yeah, we are talking about memory safety. We are talking about speed. That's, those are all really, really nice assets of a programming language. But what we haven't spoken about is like, this is a programming language that needs you to be explicit with your choices. Um, if I'm going to pass a reference, if I'm going to need something mutable, it tells me the method signature, it tells me the type, it tells me everywhere. Um, and um, this, is, this is really, if I, as an, out, uh, as an outsider, go into some new code base, which I do from time to time, I can read the code and can understand what's happening there on uh, uh, on the memory management level, because I can read the syntax and understand what's going on there. Um, so yeah, one thing that's very interesting, for example. So let's say I want to I want to free the memory of sender. I just have this function drop say sender. There you go. Um, and uh, how is drop implemented? So this is a built-in function that frees memory. Um, look at that. It's an empty function. It's an empty function, but everything that it needs to do is taking ownership of that value, because at the end of the curly brace, it's going to be dropped. Um, this function here alone, function drop, it's, it's the simplest function that you can write, but it tells you everything that you need to know about ownership, because afterwards it's whew, just gone. Okay, but hey, we need to create a chat. So we have a couple of things to do. Uh, first of all, uh, great, we, we split that. I'm going to ignore sender and receiver for now. So that we are not too distracted here, I'm going to ignore the task spawn here as well. Um, so yeah, we need to do two things, um, and we are we are we are we are going to grab a couple of things that I already prepared for that to speed up a little bit. Um, but first, we need to um, uh, get a user ID. We need to increment the global variable for the new user ID. Um, um, then we need to uh, listen for messages. Um, and then we need to broadcast these messages. And the problem here is you know, now we are multi-threaded. You know, now we're in Tokyo. Tokyo runs on multiple threads. Tokyo works in a way that you have a couple of worker threads and you have those tasks lined up. And every time an event comes, which says, hey, oh, there might be something happening with the task. It goes into a worker thread. Code is being executed. Either it's being resolved. 
then you get a result back or the task is put up again um, um, on, on, on the execution queue. So those are the things that, that might happen. And the problem now is that every, every handle socket method that we have here, or function that we have here, can work on the different thread. So we need to somehow share memory. We need to somehow connect um, everything together. It's not that we are in a single thread where we can go to globals and just ask globals for, for what we need. Like we can't have a global hash map. Yeah, we can have a global hash map, but it needs to have some, um, uh, some, some features. Um, and we need to prepare for that. And this is a lot of work. I, it's, it's such a lot of work that I even prepared um, um, a nice little drawing to tell you what we are going to do. Um, so um, this diagram here. Sorry, good morning. It's now light again. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. But here I'm having the client, which is the browser. Um, and usually um, when we are working with web sockets, this is the server task. Uh, the receiver receives messages from the client. Okay. And it also go is going to send messages to the client. This is what's going to happen here. Um, so we are receiving messages from the client, and then we want to distribute it over to a couple of channels that are owned by each uh, by each individual or by each by each connected uh, um, person. Um, and if if something goes through those senders, so they are being broadcasted to all senders, and if if they uh, um, 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 if they get one of those messages, they are going to send it back to each task. So getting something from the client, broadcasting it to all tasks. We are going to have access to those, to those transmitters and every task is going to receive that message. So um, this, this needs to be multiple, going to multiple receivers. And then everything that we got there is going to go back to the client. So this is the, this is the idea that we are going to have here. Okay, let's try that. Back again, good night. There we go. So the first thing that we're going to do is create the user ID. And I prepared a little bit about that so we can have a global here, but um, it's working a little bit different. So what I'm creating here, right on top, um, is this here. I need, don't need to import anything. Uh, that's okay. I'm having this next user ID. It's a static binding of that type, atomic U size, uh, which starts at, let's start it as, as, at zero. I guess that's very similar to the other thing. Um, this means with the static keyword that this particular piece of memory is going into the binary. So this is part of your binary. This is part of your program. And you are able to change it from there. Um, I'm using something called standard sync atomic atomic U size. So it's a U size, which means it's an unset integer um, as big as, as a register in, in your machine. So it's dependent on your machine. Um, and it also means um, it's sync, which means it can be changed from multiple threads. So this is what sync tells me. And it's atomic, which means that, um, well, there are atomic operations possible, which means that this particular piece of memory knows how to handle changes from various endpoints. So this on, on this level, you, you need to think about that on this level. I'm sorry. But hey, now I'm having this user ID. What I can do now is do something like... Um, Creating ID, I'm saying um, let user ID is next user ID, and I'm calling fetch add, which means get the current value and add one to it. And please do that in, um, I guess it's called relaxed, it's a standard sync atomic uh, ordering uh, relaxed, which means that. Um, um, Depending on how many how many uh, requests are incoming, you should say, ah, take them one after the other. It doesn't matter. So this is what I'm doing here. So now this is how I get my user ID. This is great. Um, the next thing that I need to do is create this broadcasting system. So every task needs to be able to send something to to all to all the other tasks. So I'm creating um, a multi-producer single consumer channel. Where I say I'm going to have a transmitter, I'm going to have a, um, a receiver. Um, and um, this is an MPSC, um, PSC, multi-producer single consumer unbounded channel. So this is very much like um, a channels in Go, for example. Um, I'm getting a couple of errors here for type annotations. So I'm going to annotate the type on my own, which is an unbounded um, sender. Um, of message. So message is what, what we are sending um, um, in, 
uh, in depth sockets and an unbounded receiver also of message. There you go. And I guess I need to import. No, I don't need to import anything else. Okay, cool. So now I'm having the sender and receiver. And now I need to store the senders into, in a, into a global user object. So this is like the user's object that we had before. And here I'm going to create something here um, that is going to be injected through all my codes. And I'm doing that with a, um, with a little, little helper type. So I'm creating my custom type called users because I want to store it in um, a hash map um, of use size as a key. So this is my use ID and of having an unbounded sender of message um, as value. So you can think about that really like, like a JavaScript object where you store keys and values. So this is my user key and this is my the, the, the transmitter. So where we stored the, um, um, the, the message before. Eric Tonica asks, what is a channel? A channel is basically a, a struct in uh, concurrent and parallel Rust, where you have a sender and a receiver, where you can say everything that you put into the sender is going to reach the receiver. And this is how you have two structs that you can put into two different parts of your program, and they are connected to each other and can share data with each other. Uh, instead of saying you communicate by sharing data, you say you share data by communicating. And it's a way, um, basically, to say this piece of memory is going to be important at the other end. That's a channel. Um, so the thing is, this is a hash map just like we had before, like the JavaScript object where we say use as is key and the one thing where we want to send out stuff as value. The problem is this is not possible to share that across multiple threads. For that, we need to have an RW log, a read write log. A mutex is also something um, very much like that, where we say, okay, at the moment I want to read something for that, please lock it. I want to access that memory and I want to do something. Also, the moment I want to write something to it, please lock it. I want to write something before all the others can write to it. Again, we are on system, um, operating system level. Um, and because I want to share this across multiple threads, I also need to put that into an ARC, into an atomic reference counter. And this is not really something where, oh boy, where, where, am, where, where did I go there? So an ARC um, is basically a little garbage collector without being an actual garbage collector. So what it does, it, it counts references. You say, this can, be, this can be accessed from multiple threads. Sorry, the RW log can be accessed from multiple threads. That's great. But how are you going to make sure that everybody is getting those, those RW logs? By having an atomic reference counter, you can clone that, you can create copies of that, but they don't clone the data, they are just counting a variable up and down. So it says, well, I'm counting up a number, and once I'm dropped, I'm counting down the number again. And this is how you can keep track of how many threads are going to look at that RW log. So you need to work around ownership restrictions quite a bit. Um, that answer to what is a channel only made my brain ask more questions. Isn't the channel similar to a topic that you can subscribe to? <coughs> I'm sorry. I need to think a little bit. Um, no, not quite. I guess um, the moment we are going to see how we are using them, it becomes clear. So uh, Vide, if you, if you can wait a couple of minutes, I'm going to show it to you in the example later on. So now I created a pretty elaborate type something that can store data, that can be accessed by many threads, and that can be shared by many threads. Cool. Now I'm creating this uh, particular piece. I'm saying this, those are my users. I just say users colon colon default. This works if I'm having one of those combined types that are all can be called by a default and can create a new object just like that. An empty object um, that is an atomic reference count of a read write log of a hash map of a use size. Um, as, thank you very much. Sparkling water, of course. Um, and I'm going to add that to uh, all my um, routes by saying, well, there is another layer, which is an extension uh, which uses users. And with that, I'm going to get that into this here as well. So I'm saying extension users is of type extension. Um, users. There you go. So I'm injecting it. It's great. And then I need to handle that like a callback function. So this is what I'm doing here now. This might look ugly at first, but you're getting used to it. Um, this is basically an error function in, in Rust. You can see it as an error function in Rust. Um, yuck. But 
there we go. Um, and of course, I need to uh, put it up there as well. This is, you know, um, I could either call handle socket directly, but if I want to pass my arguments, I'm going to do some sort of error function. It's called closure. You can think about it as the same thing. That's okay. So this is how I get my users from here, down here, down here. If I'm removing something like, let's say, ARC, if I'm going to say, well, this needs to be sent across threads. If I'm removing that, it tells me, dun, 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 hey, hey, what you're doing here? I can't share that across threads. This is not possible. Do something about it. The compiler tells me that there are ownership problems regarding concurrent memory or memory in concurrent situations. So, who dodge the bullet. Okay, but now I'm getting this user's object and I'm having it in here, which means I'm going to say, um, dear uh, uh, users, uh, users that I want to have write access. Um, it is um, a future, which means I need to await it. And then I can say, well, insert um, the user ID and um, the channel, there you go. One thing I guess, um, Matthias was in the chat, which is fantastic, hi. Um, um, also said, you know, use ID is a use size. Um, you can pass that by value anytime. Um, you have to think about, hey, you you have you have 32 bits on your machine that can either store a pointer to some data somewhere, or you have the actual value in there if it's possible. And with use size, reading the actual value and copying the actual value um, is um, um, as cheap as having a pointer that you need to pass around. And this is why I can take use ID and just can pass it along. Um, Sol Rec del Sol asks, what is extension and how is that working on users? This is something from, from Exum where I say, you know, um, every one of those routes needs to have this extension and needs to be able to consume this extension. Um, and it's basically some shared state, if you want. I guess the most recent version of Exum even calls it state, so you can also use it as state, but I'm used to use extension. It's basically shared global state across it. Yeah. Okay, now I'm having the user objects done. So this is, you know, users at user ID, do that, blah, blah, blah. Okay, okay. And now with that, I need to listen to some messages. So I say, um, so I'm listening to messages that come over the receiver. So I'm spawning a new Tokyo task. There you go, easy to move. It's a future here. Um, and I'm saying here that while I'm getting some messages from rx.receive dot await. Um, a couple of things that we are we, we need to talk about here. So this is this is actually beautiful. Um, I'm going to remove that sum here. Let's call it message for now. And you see that the type it becomes option of message. Um, and uh, this is a way in Rust to say, well, you can have either have some value or you can have no value. And the, as long as this receiver is able to receive stuff, I'm getting some value. Otherwise, I'm getting no value, none value. You don't have null or you don't have undefined in Rust. They don't exist. So you, no way of calling undefined is not a function. No way of having null pointing exceptions. No way of having null reference exception. No nil. No. You have state. You have either some value or you have none value. And you need to deal with them. So Rust does not allow you to not deal with it. And you can deal with it in, 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 in many ways. So if I'm now having this message here and I can say, well, match message. Please do something with it. And there you go. Either you have some value then you can work with the value. Well, you have none value, then do something about it. But the cool thing is now that um, I can also write it like that. I can say, well, this is kind of like the structuring in JavaScript. I say, well, if it is in, if it is some, some value, then please work with message. So now I can work with message here, with the actual message. The moment it gets, the moment I'm getting no message anymore, I'm getting none, this loop stops and it's ended. So this is this is really really fantastic and you know actually very um, um, very elegant if you work with it because you say hey as long as you have some messages from this channel keep them coming then you can do something cool um, 
also something, I guess this was a question like, hey, um, um, how, how are tasks being, being ordered there? The await stuff here is the key. So this tells, um, this basically says, hey, I'm having a future here. I'm having a promise here. Put it on the queue and wake it up if an event comes that, that fits to that, to that type. So wake it up like, oh, I'm, I'm having something on this channel. Let's do something. Wake up, work on it. And everything before and afterwards is just sequential code that is executed by our thread. Those await blocks say, well, this is something that I can defer or can work like now. Okay. So I'm getting, having this message here. I'm getting that from the receiver. And I'm going to send it over to the WebSocket. So I'm saying, hey, this is my WebSocket sender. Please send the message. Again, this might take some time, so I wait it. Um, and then, um, then we have the next thing. Look at that. So then we have, say, let, um, uh, let result. Now we are getting... Um, boom, 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 boom. How did I call it? Ah, okay, it's down there. Let's put it up. Um, now I'm getting a result, a result of an empty type or an error. So this is the second here, where option was first here, either I have a value or I have no value. Result means either you have a result or you have an error. Deal with it. Do something with it. So Rust Rust wants from you to work on that. And you can do a couple of things. You can either say, well, unwrap, which is an explicit ignore of it. You say, hey, whatever, whatever is happening here, I'm pretty sure it works. <laughs> unwrap the value, like unwrap the value from the result type. That's good. But if that goes wrong, your thread crashes. So it, it calls a panic and your thread crashes and the whole thread needs to start over again. So be really, really careful with that. I was writing a software with a couple of uh, uh, folks at, at, at work. We had 130 unwraps there. It was a pain to get rid of them, but it was totally worth it. So this is, this is a shortcut. Don't do that. Only do that if you can be really, really, really sure that this works out. And you know, if you think about Rust um, as a programming language that gives you correct results, this is explicit. You are explicitly ignoring it. It's not Rust ignoring it or Rust making, making some, some um, decisions for you so that you can ignore it. You need to explicitly ignore it, which also means that you can explicitly handle it. So I can say, well, um, if um, let OK, um, or no, that if this thing here is going to error, Let's connect the user. This is what we're going to write later on. So this is a possibility. You can say receive messages, but the moment we are getting an error, disconnect the user. Something is wrong with your socket. Um, and Alpha Kicks asks, uh, says, if you are really, really sure, uh, you should still use expect instead of unwrap. That's true. Yeah, so uh, expect is like an unwrap, but you can define your custom error message. Very good. Okay, now we're listening for messages on the receiver and sending it out um, from others to the socket. Cool. Now, uh, the other way around, we are getting something from the web socket and broadcasting it to others, which means that we say, while we are getting um, some uh, result um, from the receiver. And let's make that receiver also to be ignored. Receiver dot next. Oh, wait, same thing. Uh, here it's actually um, it's kind of ugly, but um, this message is packed in a result, packed in in an option. Um, so we need to destructure it twice. Um, so now we're getting this message here where we say, well, um, broadcast um, this message. Um, that's the result to all our users. So I'm writing this broadcast message now. This is going to be an async function broadcast message. It takes a message of type message um, and it takes users of type users. And here I'm going to say, well, if um, this message, if let, it's a text message, um, and broadcast it. So message is, a, is an enum. It's like a union type in TypeScript where you have the possibility to store text, binary, to ping pong or to, to close calls. We are actually only interested in text message. We are just sending text messages back and forth. 
So I'm having this, this message here. If it's a text message, then uh, for um, every um, user ID and sender in users dot read dot wait. So I'm taking my user object. I'm looking over all my users. There you go. Um, and I'm saying tx dot. Okay, I'm having a problem here. Users dot read dot wait. Boom, 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 boom. Dot wait. Okay. Yeah, now I'm having another ownership problem. So this is a loop. And users is a known struct. So I'm telling you, hey, you, you need to own users afterwards, which means after that curly brace here, you're dropping users and it's gone. So I need to tell it, well, I'm not, I don't want to own users. I'm okay with the reference. I'm having a reference, which means I need also need also other reference here. Okay, that works. This looks good. I still don't know why this is a problem, but I'm going to get to it in just a second. Yeah, so cool. Um, for loops only work if I have an, an iterator. So I'm calling an iterator, and then I can iterate over all of them. And I'm saying for every sender, send message. There you go. And I guess this is not even asynchronous. It clone the message. So I want to send it to a couple of senders um, and wrap it again. There we go. This should work out nicely. Yeah. And I'm having here a result where I say, well, let's just do it for now. Cool. And I don't need to use ID as well. So if I'm getting something from the WebSocket, send it to all channels. So I'm sending it over all channels. Which means that one message from the socket going to let's say n channels, whatever however many channels we have. They are receiving it here and sending it to the web socket again. So this is how I'm going to distribute all those messages. Cool. So I listen for messages and send them to the socket. I get messages from the socket. One thing that I need to do the moment I'm not able to get stuff from the web socket. I'm disconnected, which means I also need to remove this one entry from users. So I'm writing a disconnect function that takes my uh, the user ID and users again as a reference. And can I just I'm generating this function? Um, it's an async function, which means I need to await here and here. Please just say users work out returning nothing. And I say users dot write dot await dot remove user ID. Ooh, there you go, disconnected. Now I'm having this disconnect function. So I can also say here, well, then please, for the love of God, disconnect user ID and users. And ah, okay, I'm borrowing stuff here. But I'm happy. Ah, mm -hmm. I'm I'm so stupid because here it would be nice, but <laughs> I'm, um, I'm I'm moving it through the thread, so I can do that. Let's do that later on. Disconnect. Okay. I should work again. Okay, who? That's that's about it. Let's try it out. So we haven't checked our code in a in a long, long while. So um, why is the second while loop not in the Tokyo task? This is a really good question. Thomas uh, Peklak asks, why is the second task not in um, a Tokyo task? Um, there's a reason for that, uh, because how receiver.next works. Uh, I could spawn it in a different Tokyo task. That's totally true. That's fine. But here I just want to wait. So this is only getting um, getting messages as long as there's a connection. So I can spawn it in a different task. That's okay. Um, but I'm, I'm not getting anything out of it. So, so the thing is, the moment I can say, um, this is not receiving anything anymore, I can disconnect. And then I'm having you this curly brace and everything that I need up front is being gone. So um, I just need to sideline one thing that needs to run in parallel. I can make sure that the other thing runs in parallel as well. So there's no reason for me to do that. 
I can do it. I, I guess it might be even quite okay. Oh, task spawn async move. There you go. I guess it might be pretty easy to just do it. I don't have any ownership problems, so I can still do it, but there's no reason for it. So it's um, um, it's it's running in parallel anyway. Oh, let's do it like that. A little bit different than what I did earlier in the dry run, but hey, who cares? Ooh, let's try it out. I'm very, very curious if it works. Okay, shuttle run. Whoop. And where's my browser? Here it is. Good morning. Localhost 8000. Stefan, please don't die on me. Hi. Oh, cool. I'm having a message. Oh, fantastic. Localhost colon 8000. Uh, not Stefan. Somebody here? Yeah. Look at that. Cool. I'm, I, I can chat with myself. <laughs> Slow. Clap, but no, actually, we, we got somewhere, didn't we? So it is really exciting that we were able to create a chat like that. And, and look at it. So we, we basically, um, what we did is we went from something that is very, very high level to something where we say, oh, wow, we need to actually think a lot about memory to make that happen. So uh, we need to spawn tasks. We need to split sockets. And 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 if you think about it, yeah, so it's, it's not as comfortable as JavaScript. But there are a couple of things, a couple of things that you need to pay attention. Here we might have a problem, but we're dealing with it. In JavaScript, this might just break. This might just kill the main thread. Um, we are running on one worker thread that is probably not doing that much. We can have heavy compute on the side, just like that. Because I don't know, I guess, I guess you have 32 cores if you deploy it to shuttle. Um, you can you can have re a real power horse here that can do image processing and whatnot on the side where you can still run that. This is not possible in JavaScript. And also, I don't know if you if you've written Node.js and Node this little tool called Forever. Uh, forever is fantastic because Forever um, responds your process if there's been an error and it died. There's a reason why things like Forever exist because Node.js processes tend to die. I can make sure that this is not dying because if there's a problem, if there might be a problematic situation, I'm dealing with it. I need to deal with it. Uh, totally right. PM2, same thing as well. Yeah, uh, um, uh, probably the better choice right now. So, hey, um, this, is, um, this is fantastic. And this is going to be really, really stable software. And now I'm... Um, and okay, uh, I don't know, uh, Alpha Kicks, why this is the case, but maybe you can look at it later on. Um, I'm going to um, do one more thing. I'm doing it real, real quick because I guess I have 20 minutes left. Um, I want to enrich the message with the user ID. So this is something that we didn't do yet. Um, and then I'm using a, a nice library called 30. So I'm creating a new struct called cat message. And the struct has a name of type string. Uh, an actual message. I guess it's called message. I need to look at it um, in my cheat sheet. Yeah, it's 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 called message. Where I say, well, um, it's also string, and then I have probably a user ID, um, which is uh, an optional value of user. So the thing is, um, if it if a message comes from the browser, it just has name and message, and then I'm enriching it with the user ID. So I'm seeing the user ID with. Um, um, uh, with the received message. So that's the idea. And this is my chat message. And I want to map JSON from it and convert it to JSON again, because this is what my client understands. And I can use a little tool called 30, which is sort for serializing and deserializing. I'm going to derive the serialize trait and the deserialize trait, which means auto implemented for me, serialize deref. There you go. And now JSON is going to be convertible to this Rust struct. So I can say, where are we? Um, here. Before I'm going to do that, I want to enrich my result. 
So I'm saying um, um, let result equals enrich result result. So I'm writing a function called function enrich result. It takes a message, message, and it also should return a message. Um, message. I'm only interested in text messages. So I say match message. And then I'm getting all the possible message variants, which are text, binary, ping pong, close, whatever. Rust needs me to deal with each variant. Rust needs me to deal with each variant. I'm actually just interested in that one. Do something with this. Um, all the others, I just ignore. Whatever happens here, I don't care. We just return the message. Cool. That's already something. Now I'm having this message here. It's a string. And I want to say, well, I actually want to have a Rust struct. I want to have um, an enriched message. Or I want to have the, um, the chat message, which is um, of type chat message. I say 30 JSON from string and then passing message. So it takes the string. Yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, let's see, to do. I'm just calling to do it, gets rid of compiler errors. Uh, so um, I say, please take this. If it's JSON, then please convert it to a chat message. But the problem is, this is also something that might break. This is where I might get either a result, which is okay, or I might get something uh, which is an error, a 30 error, which means that my message is now not only a message anymore, I actually need to get a result. Either it worked or it didn't. So I'm getting a result or I'm getting a 30 JSON column, column error. Um, so this is still still a problem. Uh, yeah, ignore, ignore that up, up there. And here I need to wrap it into a result. That is easy. Um, and now, now comes something beautiful in Rust. So this might either return a chat message or an error, one of those two things. Um, and if I say, well, this might be an error, then I can just say, let's bubble it up. Use the question mark operator, let somebody else take care of that. <laughs> I don't need to take care of that. I just want to continue on the happy path. I just want to stay on the happy path with my programming. Let's just take, let some other take care of it. Cool, and now I'm having my chat message. Fantastic. Um, by the way, um, somebody asked if match is like switch. Not quite. Um, switch does not um, um, ask of you to deal with everything. For example, I could say something like I'm having here um, a let well, which is uh, 30, uh, 42, sorry, 42. And I can do something like match well. It's an I32. I say, well, um, if it's between uh, zero and um, 42 um, to this, if it's 50 to this, uh, and in all other cases um, to this. There you go. You can do something like that with match. Uh, and the thing is, you need to take care of everything. If I'm going to get rid of that, I'll error. Uh, not even quite. So uh, because I didn't do anything with it. But uh, Rust usually, if you are doing something with it, Rust requires you to take care about all those matches. So, yeah. OK, um, we can add an if inside a match. Yes, sure, you can add a miss, uh, um, an if inside a match. That's totally true. Okay. But now we have the chat message. Now we want to enrich it. We say, um, OK, I'm, of course, also uh, giving the user ID there as well. So I'm having user ID. Um, is in new size. Mm -hmm. um, and then I say the chat message uh, might have um, no use ID, change that, which means I won't have some use ID. There you go. Now I enriched it. It's fantastic. Um, expected. Oh, yeah, of course, I'm, not, I'm still not done with it. There we go. Um, now I enriched it. That's good. Um, and um, then I'm converting it back to a string again, which means my message is now um, 30 JSON um, to string from my chat message here. 
Um, and this might also error, so I'm going to bubble it up. I'm having the string again, and I can say, well, this worked out. Let's have a new message. Soft type text with that message. Okay, now I'm returning everything that I need to. So this is how I enrich it. Here I see, well, okay, this might error. There might be a problem. I might get the corrupt message. I might get a corrupt message. We are not dealing with that in JavaScript. You're just just uh, checking um, checking values there. We are not dealing with that. Even if we use TypeScript, we are assuming that what we get is correct. This is not possible in Rust. We need to do something with it. So I need to say, if I'm having an okay result, only if this works, if this particular thing works, then please broadcast it. Um, yeah, I'm having an equal sign missing here. Um, those again, those are those uh, those are those situations when you work in JavaScript. Not even TypeScript helps you here. And this is beautiful in my opinion. So I, I make sure that whatever I get, the message that I'm getting here, if it's a chat message, then it works. And this particular line here tells me that it will only work if I'm having a correct message here. Let's try it out. Uh, cargo shuttle run. Looking good with the time. Let's open it here again. Hello. Test. Cool, I'm using zero. Here again, just look at that. I can chat with myself again and I have a unique number. So one thing that I'm going to do now, um, and, and I'm just, good morning, uh, copying that um, so we, we can quickly move to an end because I want then let you play with it. I'm um, adding a little bit of security guard for me. So cargo has uh, a shuttle has this fantastic possibility to add secrets and I can inject those secrets in my code. So I can say, well, let's copy my secrets, Tomer from, uh, what's the shuttle? There you go, secrets, Tomer, um, to this folder um, and then inject those secrets here. Um, mm -hmm. oh, there we go. So I'm injecting the secrets up here. Then I'm going to import it. Wait, and I'm going to read one of those strings again. So I'm, I'm checking if uh, there's a bearer token. Um, if I don't have a bearer token, I at least want to have a bear. Yeah, it, does, it doesn't matter, but <laughs> you know, you know what, I'm, what I'm talking about. So I'm having this string here. I'm passing um, the secret along, which means I need to add the secret here as well. It's a string. And now I'm adding something where I say, well, um, I want to have admin route. So if anybody of you behaves bad, I want to kick you off the platform with a simple, simple, simple call. So I'm saying, I just copied that real quick. I'm creating admin routes. Um, yeah, so I'm creating new admin routes. Where I say I can only call those admin routes if I'm having the right bearer token. And I'm creating this disconnect user function um, where I say, there we go. This is the disconnect user function. Where I'm also getting the users. But one, one thing that is cool by, um, um, from, from XM is like, um, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I'm having here this disconnect route colon user ID. Um, and I, this colon user ID is going to be mapped like that. So I'm getting this user ID from, um, from this thing. How is shuttle secret if you're just using a dot and um, so I don't know, I don't know it exactly from the implementation, um, but you know, I'm, I'm using shuttle and it just injects those dependencies there. I don't think I have access to a dot and file. Uh, I don't need to care about that by the way. So uh, no matter where shuttle runs and what shuttle thinks it should run, I'm getting this info. Um, if I would use it um, um, with a standalone XM server, I would, would use .env. So that's a good question. And I'm taking this router and I'm going to nest it at slash admin. So yeah, that looks about right. Cool. Cargo tunnel. Not this code, the real thing. Don't. Don't change this name, please. So this is the one name where I want to make sure that this will actually work. Now for the real thing. Okay. This should be everything that there is. Whew. Cargo shuttle deploy. Let's see if it works. Uh, and of course, I love it. So I haven't checked anything in. Um, cargo is actually 
um, um, uh, Sharply is actually telling me that if you have a Git commit, it's easier because you can uh, can re uh, um, 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 reset it to that state. I'm just pushing it up. Project now found because I need to do cargo shuttle project new. Creating this project, crossing crossing fingers, it's ready, fantastic. Cargo shuttle deploy allow ready. Now for the real deal. So this is now shuttle is now building my project. It's it's um, um, using a, um, a, a build process on the server. Uh, in the release mode, and then it's it's wrapping it into this, this shuttle framework. Phosphorus asks if I'm preferring single or double quote signs. In um, in uh, uh, Rust, there's actually a difference to it. A single character quote sign is a character, and a double quote is a string. Uh, by the way, I, I haven't done that, so this is just so natural to me now. One thing that you need to know is um, this here, for example, is a string slice. So it's just so if I'm doing something like um, let x is hello. Um, this is just a readable piece of memory that is a string. It's not something that I can own and that I can work with. So I need to convert it to an own struct where I have a pointer that actually can work with memory that I can move around that can be reallocated. So there's a difference to strings as well. They at least um, they at least need to be um, 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 six kinds of strings that you could work with. Uh, uh, at the base. So um, looking at the shuttle people, so um, I'm entering the build state, but nothing is happening. Um, maybe the shuttle folks can look at it. Why? Um, maybe I'm just, you know, queuing somewhere. Uh, why does there need to be, um, so yeah, six, six strings. Um, you have the strings life, you have the own string. You have an operating stri a system string, an operating system string slice, uh, and a C string and C string slices. So, um, you, you need to have at least those six, at least those six, because um, um, Rust gives you a new TF8 string, which is great. Um, but the representation on the operating system might be different. And if you work with um, uh, people uh, with C libraries, you also need to um, um, need to be compatible with them. And uh, George's right paths are the same thing. Um, where, why does there need to be a difference between quotation marks um, or um, we that do you mean? Why does there need to be a difference between strings or with quotation marks? I don't know that. And again, dear shuttle people, can you look at my build? Maybe something is happening there, uh, because usually I'm getting a, a nice log, and I'm, I'm I don't want to call Control C because it usually breaks things. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, <laughs> <to> <laughs> Um, so we're trying to avoid getting getting rate limited and due to the, the workshop and, and ah, okay of, yeah <laughs> out of the workshop um, should be much quicker of course um, but this is okay. just a safety ah, okay you okay you, you just want to make sure that you're not flooded okay get it yeah, um, yeah. so Widi has another qu question all this to consider for a string so the thing is um, in in Firefox for example so now it goes fantastic now it it it, it deploys great um, in Firefox for example. The internal representation of a JavaScript string are 17 different structs. So you have 17 different ways of representing a string if you are writing a JavaScript string. Those are compiler optimizations for the runtime later on. Um, but SpiderMonkey has 17 different ways. Um, and and um, I don't know who said it, but there has been a really, by, by DP, uh, there has been a really good comment by them. Um, strings are so so complicated. And basically, you just work on abstraction that make it kind of usable, but they're really, really hard. Um, so um, this is really something that, that you need to take care of. Um, and um, there are a couple of cool cool traits that help you with strings, like graphemes, where you can have uh, emojis and whatnot and all those possible languages. Uh, but strings in Rust are usually UTF. So yeah, again, you know, um, we are on a systems programming level. We can write C like code, but um, strings in C are terrible, aren't they? So like, that has always been quite a problem. Okay, building, looking at it. I'm really, really curious because you are now going to chat with me on my deployed chat. If you want to demo a second deploy, it should be much, much faster. We are going to do that. So we are going to change a little thing and then deploying it again. But I want to try it out with the others. Um, I, I won't have 
want to keep that. Okay, it's running. Discord, not Discord, the real thing. So this is my site. Let's open it up. There it is. Um, I'm going to put put this one into the chat. Um, where are we? Let's see if it works. And I'm going to connect Stefan. Anybody there? Cool. Oh, great. Hi, folks. Woohoo. <laughs> Welcome to Not Discord. <laughs> Flooding it. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, this is what I wanted to have. Great. Oh, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, Wede has a fantastic comment here. While you're going to chat here, that's really, really cool. Um, JavaScript has extracted so much away from you. Um, and, and you know, this is this is the gap that we are going to spend today. We are spending the gap from, oh, great. We are going to spend the gap from having system levels programming to having these abstractions where you can write the web server. Um, and this is actually, if you look at it, you could think of Rust as a, an alternative to C++ if you want to do system level stuff. And that's true. And that's a good thing. But Rust allows you to do much, much more. I wouldn't write a web server in C++. Not at all. This is, this is not what C++ is being made for. But it works totally fine in Rust. And there's a great ecosystem to use that. And this is actually the key benefit of Rust. You have a power horse. Okay? You have a power horse that can do great code. Uh, that can create great projects. Uh, and... Um, okay, I'm going to kill epic memes now. <laughs> um, but um, you can you can use it for for great projects, um, for web projects, uh, and can still do heavy computing with it. And this is where we spend uh, where we spend something something um, all so many use cases that one single programming language usually couldn't do. And Rust fits right directly in there. So it started out as systems programming but you have the possibility to much, much, much more. <sighs> okay, that's about it. So I'm quickly looking at the chat. Uh, okay, okay, okay. And um, there we go, there we go as well. Cool, yeah, and so this is, this is basically what we, what we wanted to do. So you can have high-level programming, you can go systems level deep, and you can have anything in between. And I think this is quite exciting. So this is actually what, what excites me about Rust. So I went in there from a system level's point of view. I thought, hey, let's, let's get my old rusty system level stuff going again, because I've done that in the past. And then like, hey, but I have an ecosystem that I can actually use to write web servers. Uh, with Shuttle, it's great because they're actually deploying a web server for me. Um, and um, but also for other, other situations where you need to deal with things like that. Rust is a really, really good choice. Ecosystem is great. The programming language is great. And, you know, um, one thing that I really, really want to stretch here. Um, let's, um, let's remove that really quick. One thing that I really, really want to stretch here. Things like that. Things like the enriched result. So many problems could be there. So I could end up with data that, that doesn't allow me to change the idea or, or messages that I can't read and not TypeScript, no other tool in the world is going to prevent me from that. Rust does that. So if I'm going to serialize something and deserialize it or vice versa and change something with it, it's all typed, there's actual memory to it and I have error handling that is just a sham. So this question mark says, bubble the error up. Let's take care later on. Um, and, and then I'm taking care here, but I'm taking care. I need to take care. So this is really, really great. Um, Phosphorus is right. It's not needed to understand all the things in Rust. Um, you can use it as a high level language. You're absolutely right. Are there any resources to recommend people of concept of tasks? Um, um, Eric Tronica. So um, this is really, really cool. Um, a really good question. Um, it, I guess it's it's pretty tough if you have this concept of promises and then you map it to some actual execution. One thing that I can um, totally recommend there um, is the Tokyo blog. I also have, I'm going to share it real quick because I usually have, I have tons of material on Rust um, uh, where I uh, explain things like that in the form of slides. So I'm uh, going to share the slides on Tokyo and Rust um, in the chat. Um, 
One thing that I can also really recommend is uh, the book Programming Rust by O'Reilly. It has a big chapter on async and how async works and also with charts on, on how uh, tasks are being pulled and executed, the entire thing behind that. Um, so yeah. And there are some shuttle questions coming that I can't answer. But cool. So um, what do you think, folks? So this is this is the example. You know, um, you have a couple of things to go on from there. So the examples are up on, on GitHub. And you got the link. And I'm going to share it again. Um, and maybe try something out. So maybe try creating an administration UI for that. I'm having this one admin route there where I can, I can um, uh, kick people off the screen. But what if you have an overview where you can actually um, see um, um, see the users which are online, all of them, and then kick them with a, a click of a button or mute them or something like that. So th those those are things that um, um, that um, can be can be extended. So we have lots of things um, for that. Folks ask me um, if you can follow me on socials LinkedIn. So I'm on LinkedIn. I'm also on Twitter, not that active anymore, but I'm a DDPRRT on Twitter. That's short for that parrot. And I'm that parrot at mastodon.social. Um, and I'm going to um, to usually talk about Rust and software programming. Uh, yeah. Um, Futureproof T says, yeah, what worries uh, them is that um, it seems like I already know which libraries to reach for. This is this is very very true. Um, and you know, this is something that I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of Exxon at work. I'm doing a lot of Exxon privately. Um, and I know where to grab for that. Um, um, I'm, I'm going to share some more slides. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about that, but I have all that material up on my blog. Um, there is, uh, where is it? Um, it's introduction to, no, it's not. So no, I'm, I actually don't have it. I need to put it up. So I'm having a microservices workshop um, where I'm going to explain a couple of concepts from Exxon. Um, I'm going to put them out online on my on my website. Um, and this should be a guide through the Exxon ecosystem. Uh, but it's, you know, it's it's a ton of libraries. If you look at it, we have um phew, that's a ton. And this is this is learned in part in the hard way, but you also have to say, you know, the ecosystem is is very young. Um, Exum is in 0 0.6. That's pretty new, but it's pretty strong. Um, and I hope that we are getting some um, really good guides there uh, that guide you through that thing. Uh, like, um, uh, what does it mean to, to work with Tower? What does it mean to work with Exum? How are they com compatible with each other? Um, I also need to say that um, the documentation of all those things is really, really good. So I learned everything by looking at the docs. Uh, but you are right. You need to pick and piece uh, those things together. I guess maybe over Christmas time, I'm going to write the guide on the Rust and Tower ecosystem. That could be interesting. Yeah, follow me on my social so you can get notified about that. <laughs> uh, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Oh, I don't know. Where am I? Is this YouTube? I'm so sorry. <laughs> We're building an audience. <laughs> it looks like it. <laughs> Awesome, Stefan. Um, this this was great. Like, it was awesome, and cool. and I'm happy. Yeah, oh, with... I enjoyed it so much. I, yeah. I liked it. And how well it went. <laughs> no issues. <laughs> Almost. Not yeah, it's... yeah. I, I think I had no issues. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, I ticked off a lot of boxes that I wanted to tick off. So this is this is great. Um, and and by the way, so so um, one one message to to folks who are like now intimidated by you know lots of stuff like lots of libraries, lots of syntax, lots of concepts. Um, again, we are spanning this huge gap going from, from um, systems programming to high abstractions. Don't be worried. You can start out easily. Create the command line uh, uh, tool or create just a web server that serves some HTML. That alone can be a really, really good task of, of getting, um, getting that done. And that, yeah. that gets you started. Um, uh, so yeah, um, look at the shuttle talks. There are some really, really great examples. I love the UL shorten example, for example, um, which is, which just gets you up to speed, like, like in no time. And, um, this is something that you can read with any, any background if you've done web development. Yeah.
Yeah, and to add on top of what you said, we also have a lot of, if you're curious about Shuttle, we also have a lot of examples and in our documentation, which, which you can just copy paste and, and, and get them running. Um, as a good starting ground for any, for any like bigger, bigger takes on, on projects. Um, and Stefan, I wanted to ask you, do you have, oh, before that, um, we are also having a QA and a session on Discord um, right after mm -hmm. this part. So everyone um, is welcome to join and ask questions. The, the shuttle team will be there, Stefan will be there, and we're going to have some fun. Um, I wanted to ask you, Stefan, do you have any tips on, on how, how do people watching this, this workshop, this stream, can take this knowledge um, and, and the project that they might have built with you or will build, um, how can they build on top of on top of that? Yeah, so um, there are a couple of things that you can do. So one thing that we that we totally ignored right now are user sessions. So um, you're entering a name and then you work with it. But um, you can actually do some things like creating user sessions, store user details in a database. Um, you, uh, Shuttle provides a database for you. You're getting you're getting a Postgres database. So, so um, you know, <laughs> this is something where I was really excited when I heard that because none of those, those fancy hosts in the JavaScript world give you a database. You always need to go to some other service. But here you can inject the Postgres database and can actually work with it. This is so great. So create user, user sessions. Um, um, try to, to log them in. Try to store user details. Um, try to create an administrator UI. So there are lots of things that you can expand upon. I just took care of the chat part. But there's lots of uh, typical web stuff that you need to do to get an actual app. And those are really great things to extend this little piece that I have here. Just 100 lines of code that sends messages over the wire. So, so start with the other things. Try to create a um, nice HTML UI. Uh, look at templating languages. So um, um, there are crates out there for, for handlebars that you might know from JavaScript. Um, and something like, like um, Nunchucks or Ginger that's also there. Um, and create a nice UI, maybe better than, than mine. Try to... to uh, talk to a database, try to get some data out in, in this template. I'm sure you find a lot of things that you can expand upon that. And please, if, if you have something, show it to me. I really want to see how you improve over my code. So this is really, really going to be interesting. Okay. So like the soul asks if you will need ORMs for us. There are ORMs for us like um, Diesel and SQLX. Uh, I don't I would I would go for SQLX and I guess you're also using SQLX in your examples here if I'm not mistaken. Sorry, my internet is breaking ah, okay. up a bit. Can you repeat that? Um, so uh, um, I was talking about, there was one question for ORMs, this one here. Uh, if you need ORMs in Rust, um, there are ORMs like Diesel and SQLX. So I'm going to put them in the chat. Diesel, RS, and SQLX. And I guess your examples use SQLX, if I'm not mistaken. So we only have SQLX, if I understood the question right. Yeah, so so your examples use SQLX, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. That's true. But <laughs> hey, um, what do you say if we call it a day on Twitch and go over to uh, to Discord? Would that work for you? I just want to say a couple of more things real quick, and then we'll hop over to Discord. Yeah. Um, just just in, in, in addition to what you said, we also created a Discord channel called Build Together. Um, on our server that serves the purpose of connecting you with other members of our community um, with the goal of collaborating on projects and building together. So it's a place where you can share ideas, ask for help and work on projects with others who are also interested in Rust. And it's a great way to learn from each other and to support each other as you continue to develop your skill. Um, a couple of more things just real quick before again we move over. I will quickly remove uh, Stefan, you are the pro here. How, how could I remove our video without removing us so that the background is visible? Uh, you just remove us from the stream. So it's just like I'm removing you and I'm removing. Yeah, Stefan, but now I cannot talk if I'm removed. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so um, no, if, if we are on the stream, I guess we, I guess we need to, uh, we need to go then. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I will. I will leave the background um, mm -hmm. open for a minute after after I'm done mm -hmm. with this. Um, so as you all know, Shuttle is open source. So all sort of contributions are more than welcome. Um, as you will see on your screen in a bit, there are a couple of quick ways you can contribute to Shuttle. 
Um, one of them is storing a repo. That's the that's the one that takes the least effort, but helps us out a lot. Um, another way to contribute is to um, pick some issues from from the repo and and tackle them. We have a couple of good like um, good first issues, and you can also um, what was the third thing? Yeah, joining our Discord server and and helping out um, inside the community. We also have a heroes program where we reward those contributors that go uh, above and beyond. And then there are some perks for them. And if anyone is curious, you can ping me on Discord. Um, I'm called Ivan, and that's I-V-A-N. And in the near future, we'll also be hosting more events of a similar nature. Um, think workshops, hackathon, and other various educational and or competitive events. So make sure to stay tuned for updates. Final thing before we move on to Discord. There's one more survey um, happening, which is um, to get our feedback from you on how this workshop went, because the, the feedback really helps us out in planning the next event. And we would really appreciate if you could take a couple of minutes during um, the upcoming five minute break before we all um, get together again on Discord. Um, again, three random participants of the survey will be selected and they will be getting a $100 gift card of their choice, Stefan. Again, if you, if you want to participate here as well and grab money, <laughs> you, you can feel free to do so. Um, I'll just drop the URL into the chat. And with that said, we will be taking a five minute break before getting back together on Discord in the workshop Q&A cool. stage channel, which is at the bottom. And yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I hope that it was as great for you as it was for, for me. <laughs> and yeah, talk to you over there in five minutes. I'll leave the screen in the background open for a bit. We'll just remove ourselves. Um, and yeah, thanks once again. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for staying with us. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. See you, everyone.